It's that moment you've all been waiting for. It's episode 21 of Distro Delve Season 2, and we're going to be delving into Fedora 32, released on April 29th, just a few days after the big Ubuntu 20.4 release. Now, Fedora 32 isn't a gigantic release, but it is the first Fedora release we've seen on the show since revisiting the Distro Delve's checklist, so let's dive in. Fedora's installer is ultra simple. To start with, it always wants to use a live session. Even if you tell it that you just want to install it, you're getting a live session. The installer itself is like two, maybe three screens if you include the actual install screen. You get a language section and a partition selection. All the important account stuff happens after the install, which is cool for OEM stuff, but not so much for people who want to customize parts of their distro during or before the install. After the relatively brief install and reboot, you see the OEM logo screen, followed by the Chunky Welcome app. This is where you put in your Wi-Fi and account information, as well as set up any online accounts and privacy settings. Once we drop into the desktop session, we'll open a terminal and ask DF and Free what's going on. A fresh Fedora install weighs in at about 5.3 gigabytes, and the desktop is using around 926 megabytes of memory. HTOP was not installed by default, so I had to install it with DNF here, and damn, it was slow. To be fair, I'm not sure if DNF is the culprit here or if it's the mirrors or whatever, but I'm speeding things up here in the video. Look at how long this is taking. Just to install a simple package like HTOP, I don't understand what the hell's going on, but this is slow. Anyway, Fedora is using 126 tasks and 279 threads. So, Fedora is using GNOME 3.36. If you've used GNOME before, there's nothing particularly special here. As such, there's literally no way to customize or configure the desktop out of the box. Not without GNOME tweaks, which is not installed by default. There's an assortment of backgrounds from previous Fedora releases, but that's like all you can do to flavor your own personal desktop. It uses Wayland by default, but that's more of a Fedora Red Hat thing than a GNOME thing. In some ways, Fedora is to GNOME like what KDE is to KDE Neon or Netrunner. It's technically a pure vanilla GNOME install with no real custom tools or apps like in other distros. For GNOME 3.36, they apparently revamped the settings app for, what, the fifth time now? It doesn't really look much different. I did notice that everything was bigger. Icons in the file browser, icons and text and activities and other places. I'm guessing that's part of the desktop mobile conversion effort. I hate it. The default app selection is probably the most Spartan of all of the desktops we've seen on the show. In a weird way too, like there are relatively few apps installed, but at the same time there's Libre Office Suite, which totally clashes with the overall aesthetic of GNOME's UX design. And there's this random maps app. Oh, and it didn't work either. When we open it from the terminal, check out the error that shows up. It's a Wayland error. Hold on to your butts because we'll be seeing this error again very shortly. And something I added to the script that I forgot to do in the previous episode for Ubuntu 20.4 is to test suspend or hibernate functionality. And how did Fedora do here? Perfectly. I suspended the session and got the little blinky light on the distro drives PC and it returned to the session without any issues at all. Just fantastic. So I tried to use NeoFetch and the system noticed it wasn't installed, so it pulled it down for me. That was pretty cool, but it didn't prompt me like this for HTOP, so... Mm. This is, in fact, Fedora 32 Workstation Edition with kernel version 5.6.6. We've got 1,684 RPM packages installed, along with Bash 5.0. This is GNOME with Mutter and the stock default GNOME themes. Now, given that Fedora is a FOSS-first Linux distribution, there's no surprise that the EXT FAT USB card was not compatible. Support for it can be installed from the repo, but it's not available out of the box. Now, yet another test I forgot to include on the previous episode was mounting an encrypted internal hard drive. The drive is encrypted with Lux, and it's basically a shallow backup of the external SSD I use on the show. Fedora decrypted and mounted it just fine, but it required root to actually mount it, which I thought was a little strange. The external SSD mounted just fine without root, though. The archive tests were a little odd because each archive automatically extracted into the folder rather than opening an archive manager. And RAR file support is available out of the box. Why does Fedora ship RAR support but not EXFAT support? That was weird. Media file support was a disaster to say the least. To start with, many of these audio files just refused to open and none of the video files would open. Why, you ask? Well, that's because apps that open in full screen mode by default, such as the video player, are suddenly unable to detect the screen size. 
If we launch Totem from a terminal, we see the same Wayland error as we saw with no maps. Now I'm running the open source NVIDIA drivers here, and I tried to run a quick update with GNOME software, but my display crashed on me. I had to drop into a TTY to safely reboot the system. I went ahead and jumped ahead into the script so I could try out the proprietary drivers and updates and stuff to see if that fixed the issue. Installing these drivers isn't exactly easy on Fedora, but it's a hundred times easier than it was years ago. You can enable the additional repos straight from GNOME software, and that includes repos for NVIDIA, Steam, and some others. Unfortunately, you can't just search for the drivers or closed source stuff in general in GNOME software. No, 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 that would be way too easy. Instead, you have to install it using the terminal. I didn't see a clear like meta package, so I just installed the NVIDIA X driver and hoped for the best. And luckily, it worked. My NVIDIA drivers installed and everything seemed to be working good and I got GNOME videos to open successfully, so hey. Unfortunately though, most of the audio video files still didn't work. The video codec situation in particular is a real mess with only WebM being supported out of the box. GNOME videos tries to prompt you to search the store for additional codecs, but the ones it recommended were already installed, so. This situation is actually very similar to OpenSUSE, but unlike Fedora, the restricted stuff is super easy to install on there with one, maybe two clicks. On Fedora, it's just, it's not good. Anyway, now that we have all that stuff out of the way, let's get back on track. App image support was incomplete, with Etcher launching all right, but Caden Live complaining that the system was missing some packages, which seemed really strange to me. There's no snap support on Fedora, but flat packs are first class citizens being developed by the same group of folks. The unfortunate thing is that they take ages to install. OBS sat here for probably two minutes at 0% before it finally started installing. And the Flatpak version of OBS is just awesome. And everything worked right out of the box, even InVenc. Unlike the media files on the Brunchmark SSD, the file that OBS rendered was X264, which is open source now, and I was able to get the codec and play it back. Now the networking section for Fedora is probably the most uneventful of all of the sections in the episode. Fedora supports the whole gambit. The LNA, Samba sharing, even network discovery worked right out of the box. Direct connections work too. It's just good stuff all around. My printer required root to modify properties like the location and whether it was the default printer, which is silly. Bluetooth was testy, but it ultimately worked okay. I had to argue with the Bluetooth manager for a little bit until it finally connected the controller. Now, if you were expecting Fedora to beat Ubuntu in terms of performance, you are wrong. Fedora 32 and Ubuntu 20.4 reported almost identical Geekbench scores, and in fact, Ubuntu did a little bit better with the GPU score. How does that show up for like gaming and stuff? Well, Dirt was fantastic, and I'm playing it with a controller here. The benchmark reported 32 frames a second, which is higher than Ubuntu's 38 frames a second, and I can say by playing it right here, Fedora ran much smoother, and the experience was just better overall. Next up, we've got War Thunder, which the benchmark on Fedora reported 25 frames a second, slightly lower than Ubuntu's 26 frames a second, and it played about the same. GTA 5 was significantly more playable on Fedora despite returning a lower frame rate of 16 compared to Ubuntu's 18. Now it does chug an area where there's lots of people and stuff going on, but the thing is Ubuntu chugged like this the entire time I played it, regardless of what was around me. I also forgot to add the Mango HUD stuff here, but the numbers reported by Mango aren't accurate at all. It reported close to 30 frames a second during the GTA benchmark, which itself was reporting under 20. So Fedora is an interesting Linux distro. To be honest, I'm not sure where it fits overall in the Linux distro ecosystem. It's very similar to OpenSUSE in that it and Red Hat distros like CentOS were really popular 5, 10, and even 15 years ago but their popularity has been eclipsed by Ubuntu and Arch in recent years. When somebody asks me whether they should use Fedora, my first question is, why not Arch or why not OpenSUSE Tumbleweed? Fedora is not a rolling release distro, but it gets cutting edge updates regularly. So it's like a weird cross between a fixed release and a rolling release. Unless you really need that special Red Hat sauce like SE Linux for whatever reason or something like that, Fedora doesn't really offer anything that a vanilla Arch, or if you need a desktop, Manjaro, doesn't. And like I said, if you're looking for that cutting edge goodness, I would just opt for Tumbleweed unless you had a specific reason not to use it. And then there's also Debian testing, which again is like cutting or bleeding edge stuff. 
So where does that leave Fedora in the grand scheme of things? I mean, maybe if you really needed to test the latest GNOME or Flatpak stuff, or if you were working on a project that required you to maintain compatibility with Red Hat distros or tools? To be honest, I was confused about Fedora's place in the world of Linux distros and things, and after making this review, I think I'm actually more confused by it. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of Distro Delves, and if you did and you want to support me and the channel, you become a patron and enjoy exclusive posts about the channel and behind the scenes stuff and a playlist with old and archived videos. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.